hello everybody, welcome to Sonic Talk episode uh, 796. That's what we're at today. Uh, sorry, I was a bit distracted because the live stream is is minutes behind. I have no idea what's going on there. It must be must be some heavy congestion on the interweb. So I hope it's all getting to you folks fine. Love to see our friends in the chat room going there. Wagyu doing his best as ever to uh, do the um, the moderation and keep the whole sort of cross posting chat mechanism that we have exclusively at Sonic State here uh, working for us. I think he's even doing it from a train. That's how dedicated he is. So thanks very much to Wagyu. Nice to see Scott from Canada, Robarth, as your head. Uh, wow, well, there's a load of people I think failed music. Oh, he's a guest as well. How curious. <laughs> uh, a bunch of people there. So very nice to see, the, see you all. Uh, this is the Music Technology Podcast. We'll be talking about all the things to do with music tech in the news, uh, whether it's streaming, synthesizers, instruments, software, just interesting videos, a social comment, all that kind of stuff, it'll be coming along. Before I get you there, I'm just going to plug our Patreon, because I do that around about this time on the show. Hey, why not consider joining us on Patreon? For a mere three bucks a month, you get all our videos ad-free that we post monetized to YouTube. Uh, that basically comes at the base package. Uh, you also get access to our Discord, some additional Patreon posts, and a few bits and pieces. If you join at the upper level, you get some extra stuff. In fact, we've just posted a bunch of audio samples, 63 stereo samples from the MIDI SID. Uh, it's done for us by uh, MIDI era, so do, you'll get those. You also get, uh, obviously, the Sonic Talk ad-free and pre-show. That's on all levels. Uh, 360 uh, video of the London si three, um, Synth and Pedal Expo, 360 Walk. There's also extended videos of interviews from the recent EMOM, including 360 degree videos there and other sounds and samples and exclusive videos besides. So if you join us at the upper layer by the end of the, by the end of the show, your name will also appear in credits. It happens automatically. So if you are considering it, please join us. If you already have, thanks very much. Back to the show. Indeed, back to the show. And I should say, we're considering uh, bringing in a third tier, because everybody has three tiers, and we've only got two. Um, so uh, if you've got any suggestions, post them in the uh, the show, uh, the, the comments for the show, and we'll we'll certainly consider them. It's always good to get... I'd just like to say, uh, since Samurai is in the, in the uh, house there somewhere, or was, uh, yeah, there he goes. Uh, nice to see you, Synth Samurai. I've seen your show a few times. I think, I'm sure we've, uh, we've quoted it once or twice. Uh, I should also say, uh, quickly, coming up, we have have a few things uh, I think let me see uh, yes uh, don't forget I've, I have met, haven't mentioned this before uh, but the, our competition uh, which is win win stuff with Sonic Couture I've got the t I've got the <laughs> uh, the link right this time it's not going to a spam site um, if you join, not only do you get a chance to win, but you also get a, a sneaky, exclusive 30% off token from uh, from them. So just by entering, you get a 30% discount. That gets emailed to you once you've verified your uh, your entry. So do check that out if you want to win ACDR, which is the acoustic drum machine. And there's a whole bunch of other prizes worth up to a thousand UK pounds, which is an astonishing prize. We thank them very much for uh, for that too. Anyway, let's get on to our guests. Uh, we have oh, that's not Paulie. That would be Richard Nicole, but this is. <laughs> Paulie Alex Bow here. Uh, how are you doing, Paulie? You good? Yeah, not bad, thank you. Um, I had the week off from parenting, so this is why Ooh, I'm looking. What a release! This is why I'm looking refreshed and you know, <laughs> and well rested. But yeah, it's it's been going okay. I also found out that I don't need to do all of the mixes on my uh, the sound mixing on the Arcade Dreams project. So I'm kind of off the hook, which is cool because. It, it wasn't as fun as composing the soundtrack, you know, so I'm very happy that oh. I got to do all the fun stuff and leave the leave the um, nitty gritty of mixing, you know, dialogue and stuff to someone else. <laughs> it gives me time really? to be creative, you know. Oh, do, and how do you feel yeah. about that? I mean, because that's sometimes if that's an integrated because some I, I've yes. I'm, it's a hard thing to give up sometimes, but if you've done all put all the effort into the actual music creation, yeah. then perhaps it's yeah, it must be quite a relief. Yeah. I mean, I I did I did it, and there were some creative bits which were fun, you know, like putting little bits of reverb and stuff on, on different clips and archive clips and stuff like that, you know, to blend it together. But it's and I, you know, I believe I'll still be like credited for whatever work I did. But yeah, it's um, it's not as fun as making music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm well, glad I'll enough. have more more time to to make music essentially, and you know, 
Um, so that's really good. I got I got some new stuff. I've got my usual um, what crap has Paulie got in this oh, okay. week? Let's, let's have a look. Uh, then. Bit for you. One is one is something we might be chatting about later. It literally just came in the post. It is a cool ah, drum log. a drum log. Okay, nice. So that's cool. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, diving into some of the weird and wonderful user um, SDK uh, engines. And the other one is this. Oh, it's I heavy. I never know what we're going to see next. <laughs> okay. Ooh, it's, it's so heavy. Thing. It's a oh, oh. Casio... VZ8M. I've never seen one of those before. That's one year. Casio VZ8M. Oh, nice. So it's uh, it's like a phase distortion synth, basically. Sounds slightly similar to to like Yamaha FM, but it's got a ring modulator Heresy. as well. Heresy. <laughs> there we go. Heresy. Um, and it's based on saw waves, most of it, and not sine waves. So there's your main differences. It, it kind of has some similar tonalities, oh, uh, but it's got ring modulation and saw waves. So yeah, I'm going to be digging into that. Uh, and well, that's Nick, me. <laughs> Nick, Nick Howe says it doesn't sound at all like uh, the CZ either. So it's a very different sound. It doesn't, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's pretty cool. Well, thank you, Paulie, for sharing. Uh, we've also got uh, another guest who very kindly jumped in at the last minute when I realised that Richard Nickel probably didn't realise that he was actually not an hour away from show start. Show start. <laughs> Rob Pericelli, failed muso there, uh, looking very uh, well equipped. I see the DX1 has been replaced by, is that a poly or a matrix brute? I can't tell. Oh, it's a uh, poly, brute. poly brute, isn't it? Poly brute, nice. yeah. Nice. My th one of my favourites, that one. Yeah, it really lovely. is a brilliant synthesizer. I know yeah. I've, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's. Pr I don't think they had the same stuff that happened with other analog polyphonic synthesizers at release, which was really hard to get stay in tune, and they had to work like crazy. I mean, I'm sure there were some scrabbling behind <coughs> the scenes, but yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, you know. <laughs> All fixed. No, it, anyway, it, Rob, it, how are you? You yeah, good? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, busy. Uh, it's it's um, it's just never ending. I thought Easter might come and I get a chance to put my feet up, but no, because there's lots of things to write about and lots of things to to put together and um, yeah, preparing for things later in the year. We've got Superbooth coming, so I'm trying to get things kind of organised for that and uh, other shows as well and writing stuff. And um, I just found out today that a thing that's supposed to be here for me to review ahead of its launch shortly isn't going to be here and might not get here or, or it might get here with like 24 hours to spare so i'm gonna it's oh. gonna be a really hectic kind of Ooh. thing um yeah so but it's it, oh, it's why great. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I shy away from those zero days it's just like <laughs> yeah you know what yeah. i mean I, I, and I'll tell you what it is, and I, I, had a, I had a thing that happened recently, and I know it's kind of fun to hit the deadline and, and all that stuff, but sometimes I think, well, if us as independent reviewers are being asked to kind of basically fit in with your marketing plan, then surely that's a paid gig rather than an editorial gig. It, yeah, it can be. I mean... This is for this review is, will be a written review, you know, for, for us old ah, okay. types that, that don't do videos or, or do less of them. Um, but so it's going to be a written review, so it's going to have to go and obviously get edited and all this kind of stuff. But um, I am hoping to do something live with it, and I can't say Ooh. any more than that because obviously it's it's all a bit NDA. Um, but it's it's very exciting, and it's um, you know this year I think is going to shape up to be quite an exciting year for for all sorts of different reasons. So yeah, looking well, forward to it. You might busy, be right. Busy. I think I think Superboo is going to be quite interesting oh, for sure. It is. I think there's yeah. definitely going to be some some big boys and girls uh, um, showing up for that one, which should be nice. And I, and I think that's one thing that's quite interesting. I've noticed that uh, much earlier in the process because Superboo is in uh, May the sixteenth. I think it is. Is it sixteenth or seventh? Yeah, sixteenth. Uh, yeah, sixteenth. 16th to 18th, yeah. And, and I've been hearing that people who normally go are saying, oh, gosh, we might have left it a bit late for a booth, you know, which is quite unusual because mm. normally they're, they're quite accommodating. But uh, so I think it's going to yeah. be a big one. So we only hope that yeah. uh, Super Booth itself will be, the weather will be good because they have to put more yes. people outside, uh, which when it rains is, uh, is a very different experience. If it's, yeah, if it's like last year, it will be amazing. Because the, we yeah, the weather last year was just 
bang on. It was yeah. just it was about as good like, as it could be. Yeah, uh, it wasn't too hot, but it was warm enough, you know, for it to feel really summery. But I've I'm going a day earlier this year and leaving a day later, so I'm doing a whole five day thing in Berlin, which I'm just I cannot wait, cannot wait to yeah. do. That. Great city, great city, great fun. Yeah. Well, uh, despite all of this peddling and uh, flim-flamming that I'm, uh, I'm encouraging <laughs> my guests to do, we still don't have no Richard Nicholl, but I, I get that, and that's fine. I am sorry, Richard, that's um, totally my fault, and if anyone was looking forward to seeing him, you may, you may not. I suspect... Maybe Almost. within 10 minutes. We'll see. We'll see how that works. I've got his fader down in case he kind of curses wildly as he tries to connect. <laughs> um, just in case. You just never know what might happen. Uh, let's get on to... Um, perhaps we should do a topic. Let's see what's first. Uh, uh, well, of course, anyone get April fooled? Uh, I do have yeah. one a video which seems to be the one that kind of most... Got, because there's much less of it these days. So let's just enjoy a bit of this. <laughs> or not enjoy. It's very weird. <laughs> it, it, you can't unsee it, can you? No. This is uh, <laughs> OnlyFans. Robert Fripp doing only. He's obviously a game, a game old bird. Um, and yeah, so that was it. Robert Fripp OnlyFans. I think uh, that might have been Miss Toya's doing. I bet she encouraged you. She's probably a very bad influence on him, if you've ever seen yeah. any of the uh, uh, Sunday. But uh, there were, um, we did our very own, which was the uh, Zeller Labs Paradox, which was uh, the work of uh, Paulie and Midiera. The machine learning algorithm that, that takes a snapshot. I think I've got a, uh, did I have a, I've probably got a screen here somewhere. Did I have a screen? Yeah, I think there's one, yeah. That, uh, that takes, oh gosh, bloody cookies and everything. You've got to do all of this stuff every time <laughs> I run it. Yeah, this was the take. Uh, it's, got, um, uh, uh, it's got fungal bellows. The idea is... is it fungal bellows. Figure, fungal bellows. It figures out what notes you want. It thinks you want to play somehow via AI and plays them for you. And uh, I thought it's, quite, it's actually quite hard to do uh, at April Fool's. And there are yeah. less and less of them. And I think it's partly because it's so easy to offend somebody or other that kind of narrows down the, the the channel of jokes that you could do at at less expense and without great elaboration. So I don't know if anybody else saw one. Paulie, did you... Uh, well, you obviously contributed to that one. Um, there's I a did. quote from you in there. Um, what, uh, what, what was... What, did you see any that were, that were good in the music tech space? W one Already? of my friends read, read our article. One of my friends read our article and she said, oh, that's really interesting, yeah. I mean, some of the things have weird names like fungal bellows, but this sounds like amazing <laughs> technology. And I was like, well, I'm glad that I have your unswerving trust, you know, as a friend, because that was an April Fool's joke. So <laughs> there we go. That made me laugh. Well, so if, I, if I it actually fooled somebody, then it's, then it's, yeah, that's, that job seems done. to be, um, yeah, job done. I, I saw Robert Fripp. I, on one of my, um, on, I didn't see many more, but on one of my retro computer groups, I told everyone that I'd taken all of my Amigas to Oxfam and I was now going to be a, a vintage Macintosh musician oh. working in <laughs> black and white on Cubase 1.0. On CRT. And people were saying, yeah, and a, and a CRT, and people were saying, you know, um, what what area are you in? You know, where is this Oxfam and stuff like that? You know, or <laughs> can I arrange shipping and stuff like that? So there we go. But but two people like um, actually fell for it, and one guy said, "Why are why are you on here asking for our money? Go away. Put this on a Mac forum, beggar." He actually said, "Beggar." Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which I was, so you and then he twice. blocked me. He blocked ah. me, so well, I was like, so you were right, um, even with a quite innocuous joke, Nick, you can really offend people. There we go. Yeah, but we all know wow, that wow. The, the internet is a divisive uh, place, yes. like a school playground, and everyone's just chucked together and expected to get along, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, I know Robbie involved in writing and uh, some of the Gear News uh, articles. Did, were you were you tasked with an, an April Fool's project this year, or did you uh, no, manage to swerve no. it? I, I managed to swerve actually having to do. I did one a few years ago with the ProSynth Network when I announced on April first that we'd been acquired by Behringer, 
and I did, a, I did, I did this graphic. It was the most basic graphic in the world. It was basically the ProSynth network graphic with the Behringer triangle, you know, with a year on, just slapped on. And I just said, I'm delighted to announce that, you know, we've been acquired by Behringer, moving forward, blah, blah, blah. And again, most people got it, but some people got very upset to the point where my phone started ringing from, uh, and they said, are you flipping serious? And I'm like, no, check the date. And it was like, oh. So I'm kind of loath to do it again because I didn't want to upset anyone. Like you said, you know, you, you, you're not sure who you're going to upset or offend, but I suppose, you know, if you're going to find people that call you beggars on Facebook and, and they block you, you've probably done yourself some good there and get rid of them. But I sat on my sofa the night before April 1st and I got a little uh, email ping through and it was from this synth restoring company in Paris. And it was a genuine email from this genuine business, and they uh, we must have spoken in the past, but they they you know emailed me personally. Said, "Hi, Robbie. Um, just want to let you know we're, we're we've just put this thing on sale. It's a sequential circuits profit twenty. It's a one of a kind prototype. Uh, we we uncovered it in a dusty Parisian attic somewhere. Blah blah blah. And it was very well written and links to the reverb page, links to their uh, Instagram page, and I I click on it." And I see this thing, and the price was two hundred and two thousand and twenty euro, which then just got me a little bit suspicious because it seemed like you know twenty twenty twenty. That seems a bit odd, but I couldn't I couldn't correlate it with any like you know <laughs> April fourth, uh, sorry April first thing. So anyway, I, I'm looking at it. I'm thinking, well, that if that is an actual thing, that's that's worth t you know, talking about. So I jumped out of the sofa come to the office start typing this little news piece up you know rare profit 20 on and then it just kind of the penny eventually dropped before i hit publish or anything and i thought nah, <laughs> have they gone early because obviously now in this 24-hour world that we live in yeah it's you, april you 1st somewhere people, you hit the yeah, people so, so, writing yeah. the story yeah nice exactly yeah, nice, so. so luckily i know uh, a couple of people that worked at sequential at that time, Chris Meyer was one, um, John Bowen was another, and I, I quickly emailed both of them, and Chris got, got back to me straight away, and he said, I was involved with the firmware on all of the profits, and I never saw that. So that was a pretty conclusive <laughs> confirmation. Um, but it turns out that the only part of that that was the April's full, April Fool's was the little bit of story about it being a prototype. This thing actually does exist. It's a Profit 10. It's, sorry, it's two Profit 10s, but one's had the keyboard chopped off and they're connected via MIDI. So you can get 20 voices, 20 Profit voices Whoa. playing at once. It is a real, real thing. And they're selling it for about 32,000 quid which is right. a much more realistic price. But it actually is a thing, and they've built a special stand, so you can stand this, basically it's a Profit 10 expander module, um, sat behind it. So it's this massive thing that will always go out of tune and overheat, but hey, you know, it's it's a, it's a lovely That's thing. Interesting. It's I, I think about that. Well, I'm just wondering, because a Profit 10 in good condition has got to be worth, what? At more than half of 30 grand, yes. I would have thought. Yes. So yeah. you've actually what they've actually done is devalued two profit tens to make this profit, <laughs> which yeah. seems perhaps not what they were going for. I don't know. Yeah, yeah interesting. It, no, I almost fell for it, and then thankfully, yeah, held my horses. And uh, but as you say, doing April Fools these days is really difficult. A because we've become very cynical. <laughs> B because the internet makes it so easy to to fake things and and thirdly we live in such a world where it, everything is it's it, we can't do satire or, or, or comedy anymore about certain things because the world is just crazy enough as it is in reality so to actually sort of come out and say something cranky for for april fool's day most people go yeah whatever and move on and just glance past it <laughs> so it's very difficult yeah, to actually yeah, get no, an no, april fool's like right these days you know it's the post-truth world thing, isn't it? Yes. That, uh, yeah. Things are so ridiculous and so out of order. Um, well, it's interestingly enough, there is a theory um, that this all uh, uh, began in, uh, um, in, in, in propaganda form f from within Russia many, many years ago, where oh. they hired... Um, um, oh, I'm trying to remember... Uh, um, what's the name of the kind of artist? Surreal artists who would just do things kind of completely... Uh, uh, 
ridiculous things and by uh, flooding people with these kind of ridiculous concepts and ridiculous notions it kind of changes their opinion on what truth might be and what and how it's perceived so it's actually mm. it's, it's a kind of studied fact that's a studied thing that's been taken so so effectively you know we're probably being subjected to april fool's kind of type information every yeah. single minute of every single day now I, so, yeah so I just we wish. become desensitized yeah i just wish that we were this cynical for the other 364 days in the year um, yeah, well, that's when true. we see stuff, you know, but no, you know, it's that one day a year where we, di we discount everything. And then, you know, the next day was like, oh, that happened. You know, it's yeah, it's weird, weird world we live in. Here's a good one. Uh, I've che Kissing the Machine says I've tuned every oscillator of my Solar 50. Only joking. Yes, <laughs> I've been there <laughs> and I, ch I thought I'd tune them too. Then I went and made a cup of tea and came back to take to do a take of the piece of music that I was trying to demo for the review and they were out of tune. <laughs> so it didn't actually stay in tune very long. So you may well have, but I doubt if it stayed there for long. I would say the, uh, is it the 50, the 42, I forget which one we, uh, whatever, not the, not the most recent one, which I do believe has a much better tuning situation than the one i reviewed which is still lovely but nonetheless mm. is very difficult to actually tune uh, shall we say uh, right okay um well i'm gonna uh, um i'm gonna go early with an ad because i keep moving them into the end um end section of the show which i think is probably not what the advertisers are looking for so here's a message from our friends at isotope reintroducing trash your favorite creative distortion plugin from Isotope. Break, distort, and mangle your tracks with an endless assortment of chaotic combinations. Transform your sound in ways you never imagined. Take your tracks to new distorted dimensions with the Trash Module. Twist things even further and send your audio into another space with the Convolve module. Add energy and depth to your sound with the new Envelope Follower. Say goodbye to writer's block and distort without limits. Isotope Trash. Distortion redefined. And don't forget, uh, if you, oops, uh, don't forget if you actually uh, want to put your, uh, um, if you want to save 10%, uh, choose the code SONIC10 at checkout at isotope.com and that will save you 10% on uh, most purchases apart from hardware, uh, I believe, and uh, subscriptions. Right, uh, let's see what else do we go next. Oh, let's get immediately controversial, I think. Let's, you know, we've done the April Fools, we've gone flippant. Now let's get some good old fashioned argumentative, argumentative, uh, difficult to justify stuff. Right, let's go. This is a uh, video by uh, Sound Lab Sound Design on YouTube. And this was seven low pass filters. Had a really nicely made video, I have to say. Uh, I thought he did a great job of this. And uh, Electrics Filter Factory, Behringer Model D, MPC 2000 XL, MAM Warp 9, Electrics Filter Queen, MPC 1000, and Ensonic Mirage, Mirage with the filters. So, literally, not at all. Um, well, exactly, basically not at all scientific. But what was really interesting, even with all that gain structuring and all of the things that you would kind of wheel wax on about how important that's, how you, the uh, circuitry before the filters, I mean, some of these were just digital and have, you know, that didn't really factor in at all. The MPC 2000 XL, I'm not sure if that's digital or whether they had analog filters, I forget now. And Sonic Mirage had a Curtis filter. Um, but basically, I found almost no difference really discernibly from many of these i mean there were differences but ultimately a filter sweep on that source material i mean they weren't game matched or anything but the sonic characteristics were really similar with no resonance just you know and then it was just a matter of how the resonance interacted with the filter and mm. again there was a lot of difference but it wasn't chalk and cheese it wasn't like a sem filter and a, a and a ladder filter and I, that made me wonder are we really kind of getting a little bit kind of over most people just kind of you know they do a wah wah mouth or they got a wah wah pedal that's about as filtery as one might get i mean this is this is for people who think about and i just thought it was a really interesting thing to hear them all up against each other and i just thought wow there really isn't that much difference and these are these are, cons you know, considerably different uh, things. Oh, we have Richard Nickel here. He's just jumped in. How are you doing, Rich? It's the hours different. Yes, I, I'm, I'm going to hide you. But I know it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, ProSynth Network, you know, you are 
you and I are discussing this kind of thing on a daily, if not weekly basis. And people get really sort of, but this just made me kind of step back and go, hmm, maybe, yeah. uh, maybe you just chose a load of filters that happen to sound very similar. I mean, that's another there is possibility. That. Yeah, there is that. I mean, a filter is a filter, I guess, most of the time. The, the, the difference is can be heard maybe at the extremes but somewhere in the middle they they can all pretty much you know I, I say about synthesizers a lot you know a lot of synthesizers can sound the same as other synthesizers even though they're not supposed to you can get them pretty close mm. um and it, it's all about how the, the the user uses them uh individually but th there are you know there's a handful of filters i would say and i'm not going to say this just because he showed up but the the filter on the tiger that i've heard i've not actually i think no i've never actually played one so i'm going to write that wrong at super booth richard i'm going to come and annoy you but i have heard that filter on you know various places and it does have a quality that is not massively different from everything else but it there is uh there is a quality there and i guess if you take that quality and you can mm. you know feature that somehow you know just boost it a little bit here and there you you can make something sound really really nice i mean i've got stuff with digital filters lots you know the emacs 2 digital filter is actually a really really good filter hmm. um but i wouldn't say that it's way better than, or way worse than anything else particularly and I've, I've been messing around with my sorry wrong shoulder um with my uh, yamaha cs6x recently i just kind of pulled that off the rack thought i haven't played this for a while and the filter on that is actually not bad for a you know a completely digital synth that's working on mostly samples. Although I've got the the VL board in there, so it kind of that gives it a different character. But um, yeah, I, I I quickly watched this and thought, yeah, this is nice, but what's it actually proving? Not a lot. But yeah, nicely made video. But yeah, um, just interesting discussion thing really nothing more than yeah, that. yeah no I, I, exactly but I, I mean and i think the thing is is also like i say there are fill i mean i i agree with the uh the, the pittsburgh modular filters i'm, I'm saying I'm not just saying that because richard's here which he's still wrestling with his sound but let's say i, I would uh, i would also say the dreadbox uh erebus mark ii filter is a thing of beauty it's very unique Mm. And I would also I would also put the uh, Behringer Neutron filter in there as well as a, a unique and quite sort of different to certain filters. And I think probably the commonality between those is the fact that they're two poles. Uh, I think ostensibly anyway, uh, but they've got some other special source going on that just makes them sound completely different. Richard, uh, uh, can I, if you pick, give me a thumbs up, I can come to you and introduce you and then uh, put you on the spot. There we go, Richard <laughs> Nichol from Pittsburgh Modular. <laughs> oh, look, he's got a thumb. Wow, look at that. It's. I think your uh, I don't know your camera's just from. thumbed up you. Yeah, it's because you're using <laughs> uh, the latest OS X and uh, it's probably overlaying uh. things via your camera. Richard, lovely, thanks. I, I realized as I was going live that it hasn't the clocks haven't changed in america they have changed in however in the uk and i didn't bring it to your attention so i can only apologize no we've i'm just sorry watched the i should have uh should we've have just checked. watched the seven filters video mm -hmm. which is what we're talking i watched about, that one this morning yeah it's interesting isn't it the uh the, how similar <laughs> they seemed really in you know in broad terms yeah, I, I think uh, you know some of them, like the Mirage, had a sort of a crunchy vibe to it. And that I don't think was really necessarily part of the filter, uh, but all those filters, uh, I, I, those videos are tough because it looked like they were yeah. putting the knobs in the same spot and trying to say this should be a similar sound. But the reality of it is, even from instrument to instrument, even. Uh, talking about you know our instruments or any instrument, potentiometers are 20% potentiometers. So that means uh, they could vary in 20% in either direction. So trying to line up knobs and compare them that way is, is really, really difficult. Uh, and it, it's really, I think, the a, a filter sort of can give a, a vibe. And I think what a filter adds that makes a good filter better from maybe a doll filter is is you you start to get this kind of 3d pop out of it where it feels like it adds another starts to add another dimension to sound and, and i think that's where analog filters really shine is this ability to add additional depth to a sound i think you know the moe ladder filter obviously does that very well um 
I think the the old Roland filters that were in like the Juno 106 and the Juno 60s, those type of filters had that sort of 3D sound to them. And, you know, that's what we try to to work on as well. But so, um, I th- the one, uh, the double rack mount unit in that video, I thought had a really nice sounding filter. It had a lot of character to it. Uh, but the rest of them, I thought electrics, sounded... Maybe one of the electrics. Yeah. Or filter queen, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember years ago, a friend of mine had one of those, and we we just pummeled it with drums and guitars, and it, it, we always felt like it had a good sound to it. But it mm. filters, um, in addition to having sort of a, uh, a personal, everyone has their personal favorite, I really think there is a way to sort of judge them, but people hear things differently, so it's it's hard to say. Mm. Um, and that, that video, I thought... Uh, did a nice job of letting me hear some filters that maybe I hadn't really paid attention to in the past, like the Mirage or the uh, the MPC 2000, which I hadn't really ever listened to the filters on. But uh, yet, I, I'm not sure. I but I didn't hear any filters uh, except for the the electrics that maybe had any 3D to them in that video mm, at all. Interesting. That's interesting. I'd like to put a case forward for the digital filter in the Roland S series samplers, the TVF mm-hmm. in that. That was whippy as hell. Uh, but that's uh, that's another thing. I know, Paulie, this is interesting because yes. I mean, you must have you've got analog stuff and digital stuff. I mean, they there are. I, I it do. feels like maybe um, Sound Lab Sound Design chose what they had lying around rather than maybe what would make a good spread of different sounding filters. That's what I'm I'm I'm, I'm sensing here. It could be that potentially. Um, I know from from like my own experience uh, that I can get filters sounding very very different, usually from the extra little bits of topology and features that are put in them. So uh, let's let's see. For instance, around here, you know, I really like hybrid synths. You know, with um, digital waves into analog filters because the kind of crust of the digital wave just gets nicely you know Mm. accentuated um accentuated uh by the the analog filter um so like for instance the uh the shruth the shruti mutable instruments has a mine has a polyvox filter in it and because of the gain stage in you can really make it scream in like wild distortion and also uh fm the filter with one of the digital oscillators so then you're kind of into very unique territory i Mm. think so i kind of i like the things i like are the romance that some instruments have you know that some hybrid instruments have like the the Akai VX90 with its CEM chips. Um, the romance of things like the Korg DSS-1, which has Korg Zone 24 dB filters in, and the resonance just sounds absolutely incredibly expensive on it, which I absolutely love. And it's a very wide sounding instrument and it's a very wide looking instrument. It's an aircraft carrier. I even put a little toy plane on it because it's an aircraft carrier. Whatever, whatever um, not. A couple of helicopters. <laughs> yeah. As you do. That's it, exactly. And then uh, the other one I really like at the moment, because I can mention this, I guess, is that the Waldorf M just got an update. Um, so it has a digital filter before the analog one, so you can work you know, with them in series and do cool stuff. And I think I really like... Parallel sometimes on the polyboot, but in series filters, I'm a real fan of. So you can actually have a digital FM filter, either low pass or high pass with audio rate modulation, and then mm. tame it down a bit with the, yeah. the real SSM filter. So I like these, these combination of quirky uh, filters essentially, but I think it's either more about the vintage romance of the instrument and you know how it looks and stuff like that and what the features are because you know i really like stuff like filter fm or it's about what weird routing you can do for me right. um i, I don't it. know if that was a coherent answer but there's my thoughts <laughs> on filter that's fair enough yeah i think i i i do remember the the electrics uh, series filter because they electrics made um they were designed to go in dj consoles i seem to remember originally and there was uh 
a, a filter yeah. f- with an envelope. There was a filter, and they also, I think they did like a kill EQ as well, if I remember correctly. And I'm not sure, was there some affiliation with whatever Akai became somewhere like I, I can't remember it's a it's a very dim and distant past that but there they had there was a thing definitely going on certainly in the 90s they were doing there were there were people who sort of swore by them around about the time when the first original Sherman filter bank came out and just before these sort of stand yeah. they were one of the first actual standalone filters that wasn't kind of like a scientific piece of equipment and I think that's were they of, called uh, stuff so, like filter factory and Stuff filter like factory that. and filter queen were the two uh yeah. the two ones i queen. recall yeah and i remember that because yeah. they never used, used them, to knock them out a hundred quid <laughs> or they knocked them <laughs> really? out at sort of reduced price they were always re- was it you robbie who used to work for turnkey do you remember those or no was that was robin something? no it was uh, the robin, robin that's right i knew yeah, yeah. I, I knew i had part of that statement right but yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah <halfway. laughs> I, I was just gonna say uh, very quickly two things um and richard I, i'd love you to answer this one for me so the first thing I always go for or look for in a filter is uh, its self-oscillation because I, I just turn everything down. I just want to hear what that filter does of its own when you really get it to, to, to vibrate and that can really add something to certain sounds. So I always look for that and most recently the um, IK Multimedia Uno Synth X Pro had to get all of that in there. Um, that really does. That screams like a nasty thing, and and it can really add to, you know quality to the sound. So um, I, I don't know how that important that is in filter design. Whether that's a consideration, but also filters. It doesn't matter how good they are. It's also depending on what you put through them, because mm. if you can only put what the you know that particular synth engine through it, well that's fine because then the filter is probably tuned or you know or has been chosen for that purpose but when you start having the ability to put other things through other filters that weren't necessary that's when they can start to get really interesting and actually hear maybe more of what's going on with that filter than with the original you know source instrument so you know but yeah i I, i'm not really au fait with filter design so maybe richard you can educate me that'd be fantastic well, fortunately, well, think- we do have an analog designer <laughs> in, the- <Yay. laughs> in the building. <laughs> Finally, this is the fifth or sixth time I've been on, and something I know a little bit about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all these things are decisions made by the designers. So, uh, you know, if it self resonates, that's a decision that the designer made. Um, most filters are going to self resonate if you want them to. Uh, some of them do it uh, a little easier than others. Uh, but like, for instance, I could talk about our state variable filter, the, the Pittsburgh filter. It's, uh, mm. it's, it has the nice thing about state variable filters is the idea that they have theoretically infinite resonance without self oscillation. So the idea is that you can have more of that resonance sound without falling and slipping into self oscillation. That's a feature of uh, the state variable topology and something that that we take uh, a lot of advantage of. Now, uh, you can force it into self-oscillation if you want. And typically, uh, every filter I've played around with and ever heard, if you force them into self-oscillation, you're just going to get a sine wave. And it's almost a perfect sine wave. It sounds very nice. Uh, But that's that's a decision that the designer is going to make uh, depending on the filter. Another good example would be like the, the uh, Korg MS 20, mm-hmm. the Korg MS 20 uses what's called a Salen key filter. And that is a very unique in, you know, the resonance on a MS 20 is sort of nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it's out of control madness. It's yeah. almost like a feedback. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah. 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 And that's, that's because uh, the, the Salen key topology doesn't have a natural bandpass. So bandpass is typically where you pull from when you get the resonance. Uh, resonance is simply passing the bandpass back into the input to create that feedback loop. Right. But the uh, MS-20, there's no natural bandpass there. So you sort of, you find different ways to do it and you end up with these, I always call it the, the resonant knee where it's, it's just incredibly sharp, almost a right hand turn on those. Uh, but it gives it that character that uh, starts to define the sound. So all depending on what filter topology you're working in, you're going to get different uh, types of responses. And you take that into account when you're designing it. Like say, if you're using a, uh, 
a ladder filter, like a Moog style ladder filter. Now, uh, the way that works is as you add resonance, you lose low end. Mm. Um, while other filter topologies like the state variable and like the silent key, you don't lose the low end. But there's a trade off because as you add resonance, you, um, as you add signal going through, you bandwidth the, the resonance to the, to the signal. So if you have a strong signal going through a state variable filter, like a Pittsburgh filter, for example, you're not going to get a, there's not a lot of headroom left for resonance. So if you turn down the signal going in, there's a lot more room for resonance. So gain staging becomes very important. Mm -hmm. So this is, right, a, this is right. a good example of where the artist then, we has the control over the range of the instrument and what they want it to sound like. But that just comes down to, you know, an, an artist really knowing the instrument and understanding mm. how to work with it to get the sound that they're looking for out of it. Because all of these, all of these filters, and this is something that you can't show in a video where you're setting the knobs and then quickly sweeping the filter is all these, the sort of flavors that are involved with all the other variables. Uh, but mm. that's, that's sort of my, uh, Mm. My uh, no, standing on a box speech about filters today. I, I love uh, so, listening to so people you mean, talking. What, you know, they know what they're talking about. I love that. So you mean <laughs> Thank you, you, you really don't have to turn it all up to ten? I'm disappointed that, that <laughs> there are shades of of less. Excellent. Well, that was one of my biggest that frustrations. Clear. That was my biggest frustration with your rack when I got into your rack was. Uh, the manufacturers that I thought were making really, really good sounding gear weren't putting attenuators on anything. So there would be CV inputs and audio inputs on all these modules, but there was no attenuators. So people would just plug in people an envelope just... or an LFO and it would just be full on modulation. Right. So would everything at 11 all the time. And uh, synthesis is about subtlety and about small variations chaining them together to create something new at the end and i uh that's something that i will i will preach until i'm gone <laughs> right <laughs> excellent Absolutely. well thank you very much i think that's i think we yeah. might have just ha uh, had the, the the show title which let's talk about filters i think that's pretty much a good description of what we've been doing today uh before uh we get on to our next topic i'm going to just drop in a message from our friends over at uh uh Native instruments that's right yeah, Guitare Pro 7, still out there, still, some say, the best guitar processing suite you can get. Your new inspiration suite, in fact, filled with amps, effects and pedals to spark your creativity and shape your guitar sound. Or synth sound, also, or vocal sound, or anything else you like. It's also available in Music Production Suite 6. You can save 10% with the code SONIC10 at checkout at nativeinstruments.com. And... Uh, do check out the uh, Crosstalk Piano as well. That's just out. Uh, I don't know if it's still on offer, but still a really good buy. Thanks very much to Native Instruments. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Let's get on to uh, well, one of the one of the videos that uh, um, that well that you uh, contributed to the topics for, Paulie. Let's go there straight away. I think we should do that. I know it's a bit guitar-y, but that's fine. We've just had a guitar-based <laughs> ad. That's okay. Let's do it. which I've now sampled and that means I can use <laughs> on the button again. So uh, this is about... Uh, Good afternoon. I'll, I'll, I'll zip through because you're playing basically, you're processing your guitar through nice the media delays. with a, a sample right and now. there's various different the effects right in here. Now. Oh dear. <laughs> I encourage everybody to go and watch the video. There's some really good sounds in there, but the, I, I, th I thought what was really, because I didn't know that it was possible, because I thought the latency would be too high going through an 8-bit sampler. So effectively, the Amiga computer sure. has has some form of sample input. I mean, there have, and that's one of the qu does. first questions I had for you. Which one was that? Because <laughs> there are different cartridges that you plug in, and how, what sort of latency does it introduce? Because there didn't seem to be any there, which was quite interesting. No. The the really interesting thing, and and this is all Amigas, whichever one you get, um, <clears throat> they they put like video timing signals in the circuit. So this is why it was used a lot for early kind of VFX stuff. Um, 
And also the sound chip has direct access to the memory. So, you know, like on a, like an, an early kind of sampler with a DAC, you have to have a CPU that's writing each, indivalu- each individual value to the DAC. Um, that, that doesn't happen on an Amiga. Basically, you just get like a, a stream of, of data and the chip hands it over to this uh, other chip, Paula, um, that plays it and just does their own thing for like, you know, until, until another um, sample comes through. So, and it can loop it and stuff like that. So it's very, very non CPU intensive. And that's where the lack of latency comes in. It's not at all CPU intensive to run right, kind okay. of effects and real time samplers and stuff uh, through the Amiga. So then your only limitation is the 68,000 processor, whether it can take take the sample in from the the parallel port and these are essentially just a to d converters on the little cartridges that i showed um takes the analog sim signal goes through the parallel port and then goes um to the cpu the cpu adds its delay or whatever hands it over to paula and paula just plays it like within milliseconds um so you know n- absolutely zero kind of uh latency that i can tell interesting it was just you know like literally when there was no effect on it was literally like i was just playing the guitar through an amplifier um essentially so uh, there we go i know that was a bit techy but no but that's i asked the question but some of those sounds as well i mean they really reminded me of what a lot of really expensive boutique pedals are trying to achieve so you sure. know some of that kind of uh, bit sure. reduced uh, stuff sounded like those old uh, i forget we talked about this but those those old pedals that used to have uh, psychedelic pictures on them the zvex you know where the brown the, the brown out yeah they, they just say sound and i was thinking god they used to cost hundreds and hundreds of quid yeah and yet you can build these well, the auto biscuit hardware. and stuff like that yeah i suppose so yeah it's very interesting it's, it's it's i think assembly language is assembly language so nerds writing algorithms then for a you know for a a computer that was accessible is the same as nerds writing algorithms now basically it's just a different different architecture and uh, it's only kind of limited by the imagination of the of the person i think um who's who's programming it uh but yeah so and it was another chance for me to show off my my childhood computer that I love. Yeah, so well, we the, the thing I think the thing about this is that I find quite interesting. Is, I mean, it'd be lovely to. Pro- I mean, I guess it's a studio thing. You would not want to process that in a live situation. Or you could, but it would be a bit sketchy. You know, there would be a, an issue with that. But yeah. the idea, the notion of this kind of digital uh, processing based on sort of Amiga code, I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's almost coming back to another topic that we may get round to, which is this idea that, you know, modern hardware and you just have a little thing that you you dump into the, the spare memory and you just get it to do that stuff. And I think that's that's quite yeah. similar to the, the drum log voices and, and that sort of thing, which you may get into. T- yes. Richard, did you get a chance? Did, did you get a chance to listen to this, Richard? The uh, the because the guitar tones, I thought it was just it was just really interesting. No, I thought that the lo fi vibe was amazing. And I'm I'm all all for doing things the absolute hardest way possible. <laughs> so this this was this I thought was a perfect this is this is a perfect example of someone that that loves something enough to find ways to include it in their daily life, which I, I find fascinating. <laughs> but the sound I thought was really good and, and it and I was immediately thinking like that someone if they could write it, you know, get an emulator together in a box yes. with some dedicated yes. knobs, you could you could sell this thing all day today. Because the yeah. sounds, I, f- I feel like they were, you know, 30 years ahead of their time because those sounds are so relevant now and so interesting in today's music uh, that it's it's almost like a little secret weapon. I don't know. It's yeah. cool, isn't it? Yeah. And I suppose you can run it on a laptop, by the way. Oh, okay. You can emulate it on a laptop. And you can just assign any audio input on the emulation software to pretend to be the sampler cartridge um, and and then just run it that way. And it run 
as I said, that they've had like 30, 40 years to emulate these custom chips and they've got it really, really good. So you can kind of, you know, just try them out if you want. But yeah, a, a box would be, be cool. It, it should be sure. beige. beige. Yeah, you beige, can win it on a pie course. as well. Beige oh, box no. with knobs, you know, and little lights. It'd be cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting, and, and the, it works really well on a guitar because a guitar can be, if it's driven, you know, you're essentially you're you're kind of limiting the frequency response anyway. So eight bit doesn't yeah. seem like a massive uh, a massive downplay. I know, Robbie. I, I I know you came on at the last minute. I don't know whether you had a chance to check some of the sounds. Oh yeah, I've watched. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Well, in that case, then I I will ask you the question. <laughs> Go on then. What's the question? Well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do I think? Um, so, yeah, no, I, I'm not a guitar person. I'm not, I'm not a pedals person, so I don't really have much skin in that game or, or knowledge. Uh, and I was thinking the exact same thing was, surely somebody somewhere can take this code, put it on a, a teensy board or a pie or something, stick it into a pedal um, and flog it all day long. Um, because, you know, those, those <laughs> sounds were pretty unique and it's a lot easier to cart one of those around in your back pocket. Than it is a whole Amiga rig <laughs> or a laptop running an, an emulator, but um, no, well, that's true. Yeah. No, it's, it's lovely stuff. I mean, you know, I, I come from a world of you know sampling you know, with eight bit Fairlights and stuff, so I you know I get the whole crunchiness and and the, the quality yeah. that sampling into eight bit and then playing that back offers. Um, it is it's nice thing, but then when you start applying that to to things like guitars, it's it's even weirder and and nicer to um, to experience because it's not something you hear that often. So yeah, but always as always, great video from Paulie. So yeah. So I'm uh, just curious that the, the the software there um, that was running. Yeah. I, I, sorry, I didn't get didn't catch. Those algorithms, were they designed by that code or are they the sort of thing that would have been sort of open source at the time? Because there would be obviously some commercial value to using that stuff and you'd like yes. to think that the person would get something back from it it's if you did make it's it. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, so one one piece of software was sold in a box with one of the cartridges. That was the, the first one I, I did. Um, called the real-time effects processor and I showed that showed the box that came in the second one was freeware Treg was freeware by a guy called David O'Reilly and then the last one the really wild stuff low and guard harm harmonizer that I did with the trackball that was public domain as well free software you know um freeware and I actually managed to find the guy last night and we've been chatting oh, so nice. it's really nice and, you know, I said, you know, um, I mean, your website's full of really unique algorithms and code and you talk a lot about this stuff and you're really passionate. Are you on the autism spectrum? I said, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes, probably. Um, but I'm very high functioning. So we had a little laugh about that because, you know, the, the thin line between the geni genius and madness is definitely there with some of those algorithms. <laughs> With, which kind of leads me to the point, if you could make something that would run, uh, maybe in Max MSP, which would run those algorithms in some kind of emulation yeah. in a compiled thing, and then you could process your DAW or Ableton Live stuff in there, yeah. that might be a thing. I don't know if that's, I mean, because the, the power that we've got available, I mean, it might not be the most efficient thing way of doing it, but it might be something that was possible, and then you just assign a few macros in live say for instance i'm just thinking of that as a, as sure. a it would probably be easier to do that than it would be to create your own uh, vst and all of the kind of business that, that no would definitely mm. that that's an interesting thought so you'd need to daw which could um communicate with the emulator you know to do all those midi macro controls and yeah, stuff like yeah. that thankfully the amiga's got a backdoor um, coding language called A-Rex, where you can set stuff like that up. So it is possible, Nick, that you could idea. run the emulator, then run your DAW, and then, yeah, control one with the other. Um, but, you know, I like the real stuff, you know, the clacky keys and the, the floppy disks. I know what you mean, but I'm just thinking, you know, that because like that. I could just imagine people loving what they heard on that and go, yeah, I want to I want to do that, and just being able to sort of buy yeah. it. Or, or get a max MS, but that's interesting. I'll look into that. So, that might be someone, um, someone commented on on when you reshared it that, oh great, something else that's going to put the price up of vintage computer hardware. Because <laughs> ever since, ever since lockdown, the price of 
Commodore 64s, Amigas, um, older kind of, you know, Windows machines, Atari STs, old Macintoshes, they went up because people escaped to childhood. You know, there was all this terrible oh, stuff right, going on in the world. So people chose to escape to childhood and they bought their childhood computers in droves. So now the prices are post pandemic are just a lot more than they were before. Although so they may end up being, they may end up being the bulwark, the bulwarker of the uh, twenty you know, mid twenties, mid twenty twenties, where you will oh, find definitely. them endlessly yeah, yeah. At, at car boot sales for people who couldn't be bothered who's, with the hassle. Who's going to care once you know? Like obviously, I'm an elder millennial who who remembers this stuff. Younger millennials than me don't have these references. I know one or two that are into this stuff. So who is actually going to want? these um these computers like one day uh you know when when mm. my gen isn't here it's weird they'll all be in a museum i imagine along yeah, with kind so. of a, a waxwork figure of me holding a guitar <laughs> <laughs> i hope with really or creepy hologram, you know possibly. long stare yeah. a hologram yeah that talk to yeah, visitors, you know. Uh, I don't know if this is all going to fit on the screen. Uh, Nick Howe <laughs> says, is there a copyright time limit on algorithms like there is on, as there is on synths? You know, as there is on creative output, like it's 70 years, isn't it, on... Uh, well, on, on, I don't know. On, on creative works. I wonder if that, that's an interest. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's an interesting question to ask Nick, ask Nick, but you're probably more qualified to answer it than maybe any of us. I don't know if that's <laughs> the case. But that would, or maybe Rob's got a uh, got an insight. No, that's interesting. Not a clue. Well, no, the Fairlight, because, so, like, for instance, some of the functionality in the original Fairlight code, is that still, yes. I suppose, it, you must have still allowed it, it must still have intellectual property rights, because that's different to copyrights, isn't it? So that's, a, that's not the same thing. It, it was different back then, though, wasn't it? It they, they don't think they. I mean, I know people that are messing around with Fairlight code, and, and things will will be coming down the line um, that will use original Fairlight code. Uh, but none of the none of the stuff that we see uh, in terms of Fairlight, like the Arturia plugin, doesn't have anything mm. remotely like any Fairlight code in there. It's their interpretation of it. Um, the wonderful mm. free uh, Quasar Beach um, that Jean Luc uh, programs. That's a complete ground up rebuild. It's it's nothing to do with the original yeah. code, but the original code is out there. I mean, I've got boxes of floppy disks with the operating system on. Uh, if you want to try and get it off there, um, but it, it's out there, and um, people have messed with it over the years. And I know somebody's yeah. doing some very good work with it at the moment that we might see in the very near future. But yeah, it's oh, that's uh, cool. I don't know. I don't know anything about copyright. It's it's difficult, isn't it? Um, especially yeah. with the old stuff, because I, I don't think, think copyright. Anybody anticipated I think copyright it. is different. Yeah, I think copyright yeah. is different because copyrights for creative works, whereas intellectual property right of of, of technology yeah, yeah. Is, is protected uh, in but, perpetuity or for as long as anybody else. Right. Well, I guess Fairlight that's don't why. Exist anymore, you see. No, so. but that's why. That's presumably why uh, you have, uh, you know, Creative Commons uh, uh, and you know various different open source yeah. directives and all of that stuff. That's probably an entirely different topic. I'm sorry I brought that up at the very last minute because um, <laughs> cause it's now five o'clock. Sorry, I, I disappeared there for a minute. My my network that's all right. went. But I think what's bizarre is because this is running in the cloud, the show was continuing to run itself while I wasn't <laughs> able to connect to it. So I don't know what you said or what you That's did. You amazing. could have done anything, which is, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, but that was great. I so, wanted um, to um, yes, go mention on. one thing about it. I got one comment, I think it was on Synthtopia, of a guy who just did not get it. He was like, <laughs> why, on, why are you doing this? Why not use you know, like uh, modern VST plugins on like Linux or Windows or Mac, because, you know, you can do most of these effects and stuff like that. And also he said a very pedantic thing, because I, I said in the title, use the Amiga as a guitar pedal, he said, if you stepped on that thing, it would break. So he really did not get any of the premise of the video. And I don't think What's he, he doing was on synth quite, <laughs> I don't <Even>. know. <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't quite understand the appeal of vintage computing i don't mm. think and essentially who is going to watch another video of because i make videos for people to watch and be interested who's going to be interested in a in another video of someone just playing guitar through through vsts that everyone's heard before you know 
So what? the reason I did it was just to be a little different. I'd found all this software that no one had really heard about and, and was like, you know, oh, I'll show this off. <laughs> and we're How all you glad get it you in did. There? Do, you have, do you have to put it on a floppy and then load it in or is there another way that you can get it in there via some sort of serial connection so it makes it a little less treacherous? I do, I do use, I, I, sp I used a floppy disk on purpose for one of the pieces of software in that video. So you could hear in the background the little, hur, 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 just for a bit of nostalgia, you know. Uh, I call it nerd ASMR, right. <laughs> basically. Because, so floppy disk and trackball clicks and stuff like that. But the other thing was, um, my all of my machines are expanded and they either run off cf cards or sd cards right. which are connected yeah. to ide interfaces you know the old is it yeah. pata ide that they've got pata ide so i have a an ID to compact flash an id to uh, uh, yeah. one's got scuzzy the 3000 it's amazing and then i can set up the environment on my laptop with all the software installed, take the card out and put it straight in the Amiga and it will boot oh, nice. exactly the same. So yeah, that's, oh, that's what really I do cool. for... Nice, yeah. that's really but cool. I, but I use floppy on purpose sometimes because yeah. it's just a really nice... Well, yeah, and it's also it's like thing. waiting for the tape to rewind. It sort of creates natural yes. breathing spaces within any creative... Per I know, Be uh, kind, Richard, rewind. Ri be kind, rewind. Richard, I mean, you've got vintage technology. I can see you've got cartridge mm -hmm. games in there. Do you have a, a desire for vintage computing in your life? I mean, do you? Yeah, obviously I have. <laughs> I, I love that kind of stuff because it, like, like Polly said, it, it reminds me of my childhood. And uh, that's, there, there's something pleasurable about that. That was the toys that I played with growing up and, you know, learning how to program on, uh, Mac 128 and learning how to uh, play around on a Commodore 64. That's that's sort of what I remember as a child, other than you know being outside riding bikes and whatnot. So yeah, there's there's an allure to that. And I, I play with emulators now and then. I don't have uh, any personal excitement about getting that stuff necessarily. I do have an Atari 2600 and that sort of scratched that itch for me. But to be honest, every time I want to play the 2600, I use an emulator. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, probably quicker, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do have, you know, I have a modded 2600 to work with uh, HDMI, which is nice. But again, it's it's still somehow a pain in the butt. But uh, there's there's something about those things from your childhood that you grew that you grow inspiration from, uh, which which yeah. is fantastic because that's that's your sort of base. Uh, you know, when I started making music, I was doing it. I had a Digitech Time Machine rack mount delay, and it had a looping function on it Ooh. where you could loop up to. I had the one second version, so I could loop up to one second, and I didn't have any sort of multi tracking at that point, so I would just sit and loop drum beats and then a little bass line on a keyboard and then i would loop add my vocals to it after that you know so you use this technology that may have sounded terrible at the time and probably still sounds mm. terrible now but that's sort of irrelevant uh it's mm. it's inspiring to remember those times and then to want to use that gear again as part of your modern yeah. workflow i think it's just a natural thing because that's that's the reason why you got into making music is yeah, yeah, to, what you mean. to get that spark of joy back. Yeah, no, yeah. that's a fair point. And that's actually a very good uh, note to end the show on, I think. That's a, that's a get the spark of joy back. There we go. I, I, that's another contender for the show title. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad, Richard. You've been very uh, very productive for us. Even though you, even though you were late to the party, you, you, I had to condense you showed it up with the right beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, folks, it's been lovely to have you. I'll come to you, Robbie, first. I, I guess... Um, you're back into, you know, I'm writing for Gear News, the Pro Synth Network. Mm -hmm. Is what's what's the any big shows coming up for the for that on it's Friday well, that you do your show? 
Yep, Friday Friday evening, seven PM on YouTube and Twitch and various other places. Prosynth Network. We just we just had our fourth birthday last week, and we had a really you know, really cool show. We had uh, lots of people turn up, like Dina Perlman, Anthony Marinelli, Mick McNeil from Simple Minds. Um, he, you know, so that, that was a really cool show. This week we're just kind of back down ground, to, you know, back down to the ground. Um, what scant news there is, we'll we'll talk about, and it'll just be three old men just wittering on about you know <laughs> why is the sky blue anymore so yeah it's um yeah it's good some of that yeah lots of writing there's, there, there are a few things as you probably well know there's there's a lot of big plans you know afoot for the next few months lots of good things preparing for super booth and then synthesized in cambridge where um we're going to be joined by a guy called peter james stephen who's in the chat and um we're going to be showing off lots of emulators and because it's 84 is the kind of the, the 40th anniversary of the emulator too so we're kind oh, of celebrating that cool. this year um, and there's going to be other other things that we're preparing for for Synthfest and Bristronica we're going because we're going to be there. Press Network we're going to have a stand there as well so that's amazing nice. wow brilliant. yeah it's all really it's all kicking off Excellent. And Paulie, I guess you, you could go back to, well, you don't have to go, you, oh, well, I guess maybe you do now. Maybe the kids are back, you go back to being a parent, but you don't have to be a soundtrack mixer this week. You could do other stuff. I don't know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to release my EP on, I've got a deadline, the 29th of June, uh, because I've got a gig coming up with uh, David Wise, Pete Cannon and a guy called Hoffman who are all pretty, you know, big sort of Amiga slash video game people. So that's going to be, be in June uh, at a venue with a capacity of four or 500. And I haven't done a, a gig that big in absolute years. So it's a bit terrifying, oh, be but nah, be it'll fine. be great. But it means essentially I'm going to have a load of drunk boomers and older millennials <laughs> there watching my show and if i say to them did you enjoy my show would you like to buy a cd they're going to be like yeah we love you blah, blah, blah. so i'm going to release my ep at that gig and make like a hundred or so cds um because right. i've i've got the cover art back and yeah that'll be that'll oh, be nice. that and that's hopefully i can sell out it is yeah, a good plan that's drunk that's people that's buy cds <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can vouch for that. And uh, Richard, Richard Nickel, uh, no doubt back to uh, the world of uh, designing synthesizers and whatnot. Are you going to be in Superbooth? Are we going to see you there? I am going to be at Superbooth. I can't wait. That's my uh, favorite week of the year. Uh, we're going to be there. Wow. We're going to have lots of fun toys to play with. And I can't yeah. wait to walk around and see what everybody has. It's such a... Uh, it's sort of such an invigorating week for me because there's there's an energy amongst the designers that you sort of feed off of each other, and uh, there's a it, it sort of boosts your creativity a little bit because you get a little bit envious of what everybody else is doing. You're like, oh, I could do I could do better next time, <laughs> right? So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. No, excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to everybody in the chat. Thanks to uh, Wagyu for holding it together on a train. I don't know if he went through any tunnels and we lost connection like I did seem to do here, but I'm not on a train. I don't know what happened there. It's just maybe my <laughs> service provider just went, went down briefly. I didn't see an amber light on it, so maybe not. But, folks, thank you very much. That was Sonic Talk 796. Um, we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye.